What's up, everybody? Welcome back to the channel. My name is Kenny, and I'm here with my good friend, Stefan. How are you doing tonight? Doing great, man. We're back. We are back. Tonight, we are talking about something that's not exactly true crime, but it's uh, very interesting, so let's get right into it. Located on the border of Nepal and Tibet, Mount Everest dominates the landscape with all inspiring features. Its snow-capped peaks sits roughly 29,000 feet above sea level, and every year hundreds of tourists and thrill-seekers alike make the attempt to climb its peak, which is described as the size of a picnic table. In all the attempts over the years, there's been some tragic stories told of people losing their life for various reasons and never making it off the mountain. Left alone in the sub-zero temperatures, their bodies become reminders for all who cross them that the danger each climber faces is very real. In the last hundred years alone, over 300 people have reportedly fallen victim to this killer mountain. People every year purchase a $12,000 permit from the Nepalese government to be able to attempt the mammoth of rock and ice. China also sells permits on their side of the mountain as well. And from the numbers that I could find, uh, in 2019, approximately 891 people summited Everest. Some notable people that have conquered Everest are Malvath Perna, who was just 13 years old in 2014. She was able to make the climb, which is frankly pretty amazing. And in 1978, Franz Oprung made the first solo climb, which is insane to think about doing it all alone, especially considering all the people that, you know, lose their lives with guides. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, he was able to do it alone. And Sudarshan Gautam in 2013 managed to make it on top of Everest with no arms. This guy, complete beast, made it up there. I can't imagine doing everyday things with no arms. <laughs> yeah. Not, you know, this guy climbed Everest. Most of the people are assisted by Sherpas. Sherpa literally translates to people of the East, referring to Eastern Tibet. Without the assistance of these Sherpas, climbing Everest for most would be an impossibility. Sherpas serve as guides as well as carrying extra supplies brought by traveling tourists. It isn't just touring climbers who are dying on Everest, though. On April 18th, 2014, one of the worst disasters to hit the Everest climbing community took place, killing 16 Sherpas due to an avalanche descending upon a base camp. In response to this tragedy, numerous Sherpa climbing guides walked off the job and most climbing companies pulled out in respect for the Sherpa people mourning the loss. One of the issues that triggered the work action by Sherpas was unreasonable client demands during climbs. A quarter of the deaths that occur on Everest are directly caused due to avalanches. To say that nature is working against you is obviously an understatement. In 1921, George Mallory, a famous mountaineer of his time, led a group of men for the first British reconnaissance expedition on Mount Everest. Although the men were not trying to summit the mountain at this time, they did manage to find a route that they believed would take them to the summit. When Mallory returned in 1922 for a serious attempt to climb Everest, their trip would tragically be cut short due to an avalanche wiping out their base camp, killing seven porters. Mallory himself was even trapped under the snow, but managed to pull himself from his snowy grave. This wouldn't stop Mallory from attempting to conquer Everest, though. His next attempt would be just two years later in 1924. In June of 1924, 37-year-old George Mallory, anxious about his growing age, became more and more uncertain he would ever be able to complete his goal of making it to the summit and embark on his third and final attempt. On June 24, 1924, Mallory and his climbing partner, Andrew Irvine, would leave the advanced base camp, which was located at 21,300 feet above sea level. This pair would actually set a pretty good pace making their way up Everest. Mallory would even boast that he had only used three-fourths of his oxygen supply in a two-day span, which would indicate that the pair was traveling at about 850 steps per hour. On June 8th, an expedition member by the name of Noel O'Dell reported that he saw the pair climbing, which he believed was either on the first or second step. And he said, quote, At 12.50, just after I had emerged from a state of jubilation at finding the first definite fossils on Everest, there was a sudden clearing of the atmosphere, and the entire summit ridge and final peak of Everest were unveiled. My eyes became fixed on a tiny black silhouette on a small snow crest beneath a rock step on the ridge. 
the black spot moved. Another black spot became apparent and moved up to the snow to join the other on the crest. The first then approached the great rock step and shortly emerged at the top. The second did likewise. Then the whole fascinating vision vanished, enveloped in cloud once more. This will be the last time George Mallory would be seen for the next 75 years. And as for his climbing partner, young Andrew Irvine, he has never been found, although several attempts were made to locate his body. While on expedition in 1936, mountaineer and author Frank Smith reported a possible body found just under where Andrew's axe was found three years prior, stating, quote, I was scanning the face from base camp through a high-powered telescope when I saw something queer in the goalie below the scree shelf. Of course, it was a long way away and very small, but I have a 6'6 eyesight and do not believe it was a rock. This object was at precisely the point where Mallory and Irvine would have fallen had they rolled on over the scree slopes. In 1986, Tom Holzel received information that a Chinese climber by the name of Zhang Zhujan and his tentmate Wang Hungbao had stumbled across an English dead at 26,000 feet in 1975. On the last day of the expedition, Holzel met with Zhang Junyan, who reiterated that despite official denials from the Chinese Mountaineering Association, Wang had come across from on a short excursion and described finding, quote, a foreign mountaineer. And get this, Wang was killed in an avalanche the day after delivering this verbal report. So the location was never more precisely fixed. I mean, that's just crazy. The amount of uh, death happening on that mountain is, is insane. Yeah, man. back to back. In 1999, the Mallory and Irvine Research Expedition, sponsored in part by the TV show Nova and the BBC, arrived at Everest to search for the long-lost pair of climbers. And just hours into their search on May 4th, 1999, the team would stumble upon an unknown body, face down and frozen into the mountain itself. The mystery body was found on the north face of Everest, 26,800 feet up. Originally, the body was found by Conrad Anker, who described what he originally saw that caught his eye, saying, quote, Initially, I saw a blue and yellow object fluttering in the wind. I didn't know what that was, so I saw that, and I go, I'm going to go look at this. So I go, and I'm looking at this yellow thing, and I looked over to my right and saw a patch of white that wasn't rock, and it wasn't snow. And all of a sudden, I thought, Okay, let me go look over there. As I started traversing closer to this, I saw what appeared to be a lower part of her leg, and it was the heel, and I ascertained it was an old body. It had hobnail boots, natural fiber clothing, it had worn all the way down, and it was just his bare upper back exposed. His torso was exposed, so the elements, so I had to call over the radio. You can still see the video on YouTube showing their findings. The video shows the remains of a climber that has clearly been there for quite a long time. The body's skin had been bleached white from constant rays from the sun. The arms stretched out, showing tattered clothing, and even a shoe is found still attached to the climber's foot. They noticed that the climber had a clear break in his leg and assumed he must have fallen from the scree and met his fate. By the way, we're not going to put this video in our video because YouTube just might not like that. Um, It's not... A video, it just could get our video taken down, and I don't trust it. Initially, they suspected that they had found Andrew Irvine, but were blown away when they found a tag still attached to the back of the climber shirt reading G. Lee Mallory. Immediately, they knew that their search wasn't in vain. Although they were skeptical of 100% confirming it was indeed Mallory and not just someone else wearing his clothes, they know of only two pre-World War II bodies that could be found wearing these types of clothes, and they could only have been Mallory or Irvine. A brass altimeter, a stag-handled pocket knife with a leather case, and an unbroken pair of snow goggles were recovered from the pockets of the clothing. Also on the body are a letter and a bill from a London supplier of climbing equipment, later confirming the identity of the body. The team then decides to make a makeshift grave for George using rocks and dirt, and they leave him at his final resting place. Many speculate if Mallory was actually able to summit Everest before he met his fate, and many climbers at least think it's very possible he could have. 
When you consider what the early Mountaineers wore up there, it's pretty insane. Basic tweed jackets layered up, sometimes up to eight layers, with layers of wool, silk, and cotton in between. And, you know, not a, a damn windbreaker to be found up on that mountain in this time. Like, that was one thing I never considered. Like, what were these dudes actually wearing when they were up there before, like, this modern clothing technology? Um, so it was pretty crazy that they were just, like, up there in sheep's wool and, and still managing to to make it. Uh, yeah, so also worth noting here, it was common among early mountaineers uh, to frown upon other climbers using oxygen tanks as a, quote, crutch to make it up the mountain. Like, so <laughs> that's so hardcore. You're not a badass if you, if you need air. Okay? Yeah, I mean, come on, dude. How many, how many handicaps do you need? Speaking of not using oxygen while ascending Everest, our next tragic story is about Frances Arzentiev who was the first woman to conquer the mountain without using any supplemental oxygen. However, it would be her descent that would prove to be deadly. In May of 1998, the 40-year-old Colorado native would arrive at the Everest base camp along with her husband, Sergei Arzentiev. By the 17th of May, the couple had made it to the advanced base camp and were making their way to the North Col. By May 19th, the couple had reached 8,200 meters. Sergei reported via radio that the couple was doing just fine and preparing to make their final push to the summit. A day later, the couple would make their first attempt, but it was cut short due to both of their headlamps failing, forcing them to turn around and head back to camp. The next day, they would make another attempt, but turn around after just making it 50 to 100 meters. Keep in mind, above 8,000 meters, you are basically only getting about a third of the oxygen you are supposed to, if you are not receiving any supplemental oxygen, making it extremely difficult to do anything, um, any type of strenuous activities. The final ascent made by the couple would take place on May 22nd, and like the attempt before, their movements were made slow by not having the oxygen to power their bodies. Movement had become slowed, and because of this, the couple had been trying to summit dangerously late in the day, again forcing the couple to spend the night at 8,000 meters in freezing cold temps. Now, somehow, somehow the couple would end up getting separated. I've heard a couple theories on how this could happen, but I really don't think anyone knows for sure um, what exactly happened that night, which is a little frustrating, but it's just the truth. I mean, it kind of makes sense. There, I mean, snow everywhere, I don't know. Yeah, anything could have happened, really. The next morning, Sergei would make his way back to the base camp, only to discover that Francis had never shown up. Panicking, Sergei gathered medicine and oxygen and headed back up the mountain in search of his wife. Details of what happened next are uncertain, but most accounts suggest that on the morning of May 23rd, Francis Artiev was encountered by a Uzbek team who were climbing up the final few hundred meters to the summit. She appeared to be half-conscious affected by oxygen deprivation and frostbite had already begun to set in. Unable to move on her own, the team did what they could, giving her oxygen and carrying her down as far as they could until, depleted of their own oxygen, they became too fatigued to continue the effort. When they left Francis, she was still alive. As the Uzbek climbers made their way down to camp for that evening, they encountered Sergei on his way back up to his wife. And this, is, this was the last time he was seen alive. The next morning, Francis is encountered by Ian Woodall, along with other climbers as they make their way up to the summit, uh, which was just a few hundred meters away for them. Francis was in the same exact spot she was left the previous day. Located near her body, Sergei's axe and climbing rope are found, but he is nowhere in sight. Francis was barely alive, but she still had a heartbeat. The team would tend to her the best they could, but they were forced to leave her again due to not being able to carry her out of the perilous location. She died as they found her, lying on her side, still clipped onto the guide rope. The same team that found George Mallory in 1999 found Sergei's body on a lower cliff face near where his wife died. It's thought in his attempt to save the love of his life, he ended up falling to his own death very tragically. Frances would remain in her Sleeping Beauty pose for the next nine years. Ian, accompanied by a Sherpa, would return to her in 2007 
where the two would perform a burial ritual and then push her further down the north face of Everest, where she would no longer be visible to climbers. Before sending her off, Ian notes that he whispered a message from Francis' son, covered her in an American flag, and tucked a teddy bear into her arm. Yeah, super sad, man. She died with the person she loved, at least trying to save her. Um, Yeah, it's messed up. Well, it doesn't get much better going from here. Do you want to talk about David Sharp? Sure. Yeah, mountaineer and mechanical engineer David Sharp would arrive at Everest to make his first attempt in 2003. And David was forced to turn around due to suffering from frostbite so severe he ended up losing several of his toes. In his second outing, Sharp would make it to 28,000 feet before turning around after falling behind his group. Again, getting frostbite on his hands, not only was he determined to summit, he wanted to make it to the top using no supplemental oxygen. Sound familiar? To make things even more extreme, David wanted to do it all alone without the help of anyone else, a completely solo climb. This dude was truly either hardcore or an absolute lunatic. David's third trip to Everest would take place in 2006, where unlike the times before, he would purchase a basic service package, which which consisted of the permit to climb, a trip into Tibet, oxygen equipment, transportation, food, and tents up to the Mount Everest Advanced Base Camp, which was at an elevation of 20,800 feet. So he's taking some precautions. Sharp would only take two supplementary oxygen bottles, which is only enough for about 8 to 10 hours of climbing at high altitude. The only reason he would bring the oxygen was for an emergency. Also worth noting here, he didn't even bring a radio to call for help if he did encounter problems. And Sharp also opted to climb alone without a climbing Sherpa as well. The group Sharp was with was not really an expedition and had no leader as well as no one tracking climbers. Five days after being at the advanced base camp, making preparations and getting used to the altitude, David Sharp would make his attempt to summit Mount Everest on May 13th. David didn't tell anyone at camp, although some climbers did see him making his way up. It isn't known if he ever reached the summit or if he had to turn back near the summit, but on May 14th, Sharp descended very late in the day. Due to horrible blizzard conditions, he was forced to camp exposed to the extreme conditions above 26,000 feet. Obviously, this wasn't ideal. The place David chose to camp was known as Green Boots Cave by climbers because this was the final resting place for the body of an unknown man wearing bright green boots. Green Boots could be seen laying on his side, half covered in snow, underneath an overhang, as if just laying down for a nap. Iconic. What emotions David must have felt seeing Green Boots and knowing what was to come. There, sitting next to Green Boots with his arms collapsed around his legs, David would eventually succumb to the elements. Several climbing groups would see Sharp alive while making their way up the mountain as well. The first expedition team passed by Sharp during their ascent. They passed at a location on the common north route by a spot known as the Exit Cracks. When the team descended, they saw Sharp again at the base of the third step around 11 o'clock. By the time the expedition had descended to the second step, more than one hour later, they looked back to see that Sharp was above the third step, but was climbing very slowly. Another source that mentions Sharp claims there was a team of Turkish climbers that left their high camp in the evening on May 14th, and they were traveling in three separate groups. The first group encountered Sharp around midnight, noticed he was alive, and thought that he appeared to be a climber taking a short break. Sharp waved them on. Sometime later, others who noticed Sharp thought he was already dead. It's pretty nuts to think that just just seeing seeing Sharp there and he just waving you on, just like, go ahead. (laughs) Meanwhile, he's like dying. He's trying to stay alive. Yeah, not only that, a lot of people, too, pay a lot of money to make it to the summit. So they're just worried about their own Instagram pictures, essentially. Like, everyone's just trying to get up there to show off, get down, and... Yeah, I mean, and it's not just, obviously, it's not just Instagram pictures. You know, they're trying to make, it's a big achievement, you know. So, like you said, they're not paying attention to everyone. They're trying to do their own thing. And if it's just some guy, he looks like he's taking a break, it's probably not too big of a deal to them in the moment. 
Some of the Turkish team summited early on the morning of May 15th, and some turned back near the summit due to difficulties one of the team members was having. The Turkish team members who turned back encountered Sharp again. One of them, who had previously passed Sharp in the night and thought Sharp was a climber who had recently died. In the daylight, they realized that Sharp was still clinging to life. Sharp had no oxygen left, had serious frostbite, and some of his limbs were frozen. Two of the Turkish climbers stayed, gave them something to drink, and tried to help him move. When they ran low on oxygen, they left with the intent to return. The Turks' initial effort to help was thwarted by their own problems trying to get another member of their group down to safety. Hours later, two other members of the Turkish team cleaned out Sharp's iced-up mass to give him oxygen, but they started to run out of oxygen themselves and had to descend. The second team of Hymex climbers included Max Chaya, New Zealand double amputee Mark Inglis, Wayne Alexander, Discovery cameraman Mark Waitu, and experienced climbing guide Mark Woodward and their Sherpas. At about 1 a.m., Woodward and his group encountered Sharp, who Woodward knew should not be there. He was not conscious or moving and had severe frostbite, but they could see that he was breathing. Woodward noticed Sharp had thin gloves and no oxygen and indicated that they yelled at Sharp to get up, get moving, and follow the headlamps back to the high camps. Woodward shined a headlamp in Sharp's eyes, but Sharp was unresponsive. Woodward thought he was almost dead and most likely in a hypothermic coma. He then attempted to radio their advanced base camp about Sharp, but got no reply. Alexander commented, quote, God bless, rest in peace, end quote, before the group moved on. Woodward said it was not an easy decision to make, but his chief responsibility was the safety of his team members, and stopping in the extreme cold at that time would have risked the lives of his team. At that elevation, one has to be conscious and able to walk to attempt a rescue. Some 30 to 40 people would cross David on the day he passed away, and no one was able to give him the help he needed. David's body is still on Everest, even though now it is no longer visible. David's mother doesn't blame any of the other climbers for not saving her son, quoting, Your responsibility is to save yourself, not to try and save anybody else. Which is true, it's very true, but it's also... Crazy. Everest is a crazy place to be. Yeah, man. It's pretty nuts. It's um I, I do in my life I have a pretty general uh interest in anyone that does these like long um like I, I'm really interested in like triathletes and uh, marathon runners and like ultra marathon runners. You know, obviously I don't do it, but it's very interesting to see people put themselves through these in, in just intense uh, things like climbing Mount Everest. And, you know, there are people that run uh, dozens of miles. I mean, there are ultra marathon runners who can run like 60 miles and um, or more even. And, uh, yeah, it's, it's nuts to think that these people exist. I've truly learned so much from researching this episode, and I guess uh, the message that I wanted to convey is that uh, I have a massive amount of respect for the people who have lost their lives on Everest, and even the people who uh, attempt to summit and don't make it, people that have made it. Uh, Nature can be a savage beast, and the peaks of Everest continually remind me of how truly small we are in this world. Uh, Yeah, it's just amazing. So I hope you guys like this episode. Uh, Let us know in the comments. Like, subscribe, all that good stuff. Bye. We're back.